Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your truly humble under Gans of weekly cultural review. I'm John Caramonica, a critic of the New York Times. You crack yourself up. I'm I Joe Coscarelli. <laughs> Someone has to. <laughs> I'm a reporter at the New York Times. Before we get into the episode uh, this week, youtube.com slash popcast, our own channel. It's our little, we're cradling it. Brand new. Brand new. Subscribe. Uh, we are here every Wednesday uh, with new episodes. There's new shorts, new outtakes, uh, clips throughout the week, vertical videos. Get in the comments, bloopers. You know the whole thing. Anyway, YouTube.com/slash podcast. Uh, smash that subscribe. Uh, we have an active week. There's yeah. a lot. This is. Uh, it was been was like weirdly slow. Maybe we're back though after the holiday before the other holidays. That is true. Um, and. Uh, I know the thing that everybody did this week, including us, was go see Beyonce's Renaissance tour film. Uh, our screening, we went together yesterday. Yep. Uh, our, our, I thought our screening was like pretty up. Yes, like for a Sunday evening. Yeah, like or like a late afternoon. Like yeah, the energy in the crowd very very similar to the energy on the screen. Mm -hmm. I thought. So we're going to talk about the Renaissance film. Uh, we are also going to talk about um, the new Garth Brooks box set, which I literally didn't bring. You didn't bring the Garth I didn't Brooks bring the box. box set that is so limited edition. You're one of you're one of a few people. I'm one of seven people in America <laughs> who possess this box set, <laughs> and you didn't bring it. I li I'm so sorry. Uh, we'll put it on the screen. Insert, yeah, <laughs> insert JPEG here of the Garth Brooks box set. Uh, we will talk about the new Garth Brooks box set why it's so hard to get it and what that means for old people making music. <laughs> oh, you're going there. Yeah, we're going to tie this together. Okay. I'm going to tie this into last week. A lot of y'all in the comments, I got to be honest, a lot of people come up to me and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I, you know, like, I got no problem with Joe, but, like, he was dead wrong last week. But, look, somebody has to get the takes off. And let's just say wow. I struck a nerve. You I struck did. a nerve. You did. I started conversation. Struck a nerve. Another medical condition of the elderly. <laughs> yeah. I struck a nerve. <laughs> That's what we're here for. I want to mm -hmm. talk about it. Okay. But, uh, look, I heard a lot of exceptions. Yeah. And I heard plenty no, of no, ru no rules. rules. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about this Garth Brooks thing Briefly, and but when we are going to talk about should older people make reality television, uh, Golden Bachelor has come to a conclusion. Question mark. Uh, we're going to talk about the finale, which Joe slept through half of, and I'm going to catch him <laughs> up on what happened. Uh, and There's only so many hours in the day, which is what I learned from Beyonce. I thought that's what you learned from older rappers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, songs of the week, snack of the week. Uh, you know who's snacking and who has songs is Beyonce. I have nothing to prove to anyone at this point. <laughs> we are creating our own world. This is my reward. Nobody can take that away from me. There are a lot of revelations in Renaissance, a film by Beyonce, one of which is you get to see Beyonce eat. Twice. I, and this may seem uh, minor. This may seem uh, culturally insignificant. But one of the sort of um, promised points of this movie is a privileged behind-the-scenes access into what it takes to make Beyonce and the Beyonce tour happen. That involves Beyonce, historically someone incredibly tight and controlling about narrative and information flow, relenting just a bit and giving a tiny bit more access to cameras and vulnerability and intimacy and showing things that historically have not been shown. This is, um, as our colleague Wesley pointed out, this is the fifth Beyonce film and it is the most the fifth film by Beyonce. This is not counting Austin Powers no. and Obsessed. Uh, not counting Carmen, the hip hop bro, which, you know, MTV films, RIP. Um, so we see this in bits and pieces in this movie. Um, the Renaissance film is obviously about the Renaissance tour. Uh, it is part concert film, part 
travelogue of what it takes to make the Renaissance tour. Uh, one of the things that she emphasizes in the voiceover and the narration of this film is she wanted to display exactly how much labor it took to have a tour of this scale happen. This is four years in the making. You see crew members doing crew member things, lighting people doing lighting things, uh, gaffers gaffing, I've yeah. got to assume. Yeah. I don't know what a gaffer does, but I've got to assume at least one of them's in there. Doing she rattles do. off every job Jobs, on the tour. Like all the credits at the end, yeah. she's just doing a, uh, a reading of those names. Um, this is the first Beyonce tour of this scale in many years. Renaissance as an album is a very dance music forward album. You're seeing a lot of that exuberance on stage. I was actually low-key surprised not to see more of it in the crowd, especially if we're coming back from, uh, if we're, we're obviously living in the immediate shadow of the Taylor Swift Eras Tour uh, film, and you see a tremendous amount of crowd work. I thought there was more crowd in Renaissance, uh, way more than in the Eras But I didn't film. get the sense, of they, they mostly seemed accents to what was happening with the rest of the film. To me, I didn't feel like you got... You, you wanted to live in characters. the crowd more? I wanted, I wanted to see more characters You had in the Cardi crowd. B during the Mute Challenge. Very... <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but I was expecting a little... I think in those moments, I was expecting the crowd to be a little bit more present. Huh. I did not feel this at all. I thought, mm -hmm. especially after Eras Tour, in which I think I said on the show that I wanted a little bit more crowd because mm -hmm. I found those moments to be really moving. Mm -hmm. And I felt sated in that respect from Renaissance. To me, the hits on the crowd were very quick. They were quick. And they felt gestural and a little symbolic. Hmm. Because of that. Okay. Um, the music, I was consistently struck, and again, I think this is what Beyonce wants you to take away from this film. The labor attached to the performance of the songs and the labor attached to the execution of the stage show. Yes. I'm consistently struck in this movie by how close the cameras are. In Aerosaur, there are moments where I'm like, like camera really just... They're trying to capture the scale of a stadium. That's not what's happening in this film. What's happening is the camera is like as close as I am to you. The camera really wants to communicate the sweat, the muscle. I remember this is a very like niche Beyonce online controversy from a few years ago. But do you remember like BuzzFeed? I don't think this is niche. I is think it this not is niche? major. You yeah. know the one I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the thing where BuzzFeed posted like 40 photos of Beyonce from some concert and they were all on wire services, like they were all available, but she has a lot of- They were all the imperfect photos. Yes, but there are a lot of like strong facial expressions, uh, you know, contorted facial expressions and- Like a weird snarl, like uh, 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 in the middle of saying something. Like... But, but also it's like, I remember looking at those photos and being like, this is a person who is a working hard. And obviously, if you're working hard, not every still photo of you is going to capture a perfect, flawless... Uh, Her team did not take it that way. Correct. But I felt the... I remember at the time being like, this actually shows just how hard Beyonce is working. And then I was struck in this film, you don't think. I had the exact thought during the movie. Yes. I thought... I see the cuts where they're avoiding the BuzzFeed photos. Yes, but I do think there were moments where there's up close and you see her doing like there's never moments. never anything less than perfect. I, I mm, okay, that's an interesting way. To, I, I took it as they were conceding a little bit more than maybe that they would have previously. I didn't feel five it. to ten years ago. I didn't feel it, and oh, I think this gets. But I think this gets at a larger issue, which is when the film is over, cutting to the end. You see written, directed, and performed or produced by Beyonce. Uh, yeah. It's a whatever. They give her credit for three things. Mm -hmm. But she is in charge of this movie. Mm -hmm. She directed this film. Taylor Swift did not direct Eros Tour film, but she's in charge of the Eros Tour film. Like, so what I'm <laughs> saying is like even a twelve year old directed. <laughs> <laughs> even in the appearance of revealing the appearance of, of imperfection of yeah. vulnerability whatever and this is very beyonce it's like she's telling you all the time how much she's showing you she's not showing you all that much ultimately it's only by comparison yes it's only by comparison and to previous beyonce things yes and um we'll get into this in a minute but 
you know, Wesley also sort of draws a little bit of a link to Madonna's Truth or Dare, um, which I spent some time last night and earlier today catching up on, which I haven't seen in a few years the last time. As the last Joe, time we saw a movie together. Yeah, exactly. The first and the last, last time we saw a movie together before yesterday evening at the Renaissance Was film. a Truth or Dare screening at Metrograph. An anniversary when they reprinted it or right. whatever a couple years back. Anyone that comes into this insane atmosphere, when they come into your dressing room, when they come wherever you are, they feel crazy. I'm making this movie because I'm not afraid of the truth. Truth or dare, Madonna? Dare. And it is the music documentary. It's the Naplu Ultra. If that exact film came out today, it would be hailed as a vanguard film. The fact that it came out in 1992 or whatever, or 91, unthinkable. Uh, everything that people have done in, in, in its wake as far as like, revealing tour documentaries or even something like the Metallica, some kind of monster or whatever, like anything with a pop star pretending towards transparency and vulnerability is pale in comparison to that film. And that goes to the point that I was just making because that film is directed by somebody who is not Madonna. Like there is a documentarian Mm -hmm. there. A shooter. (laughs) Yes. To figure out, what really goes on behind the scenes right. of a Madonna tour, mm-hmm. and they find it, and it's ugly often. Yes. There are some things in that movie that are distasteful, both from Madonna, from others, done to her, done by her. Absolutely. Like, that is real journalism, in a way. Yeah. In, in a way that not all documentary is. No, and um, so if you watch uh, the Renaissance tour film with that in mind, it doesn't necessarily reveal that much. The thing that's often revealed in the behind the scenes footage is just how in control Beyonce is. Now, again, I'm very struck by those scenes where a lighting guy says, oh, no such lighting thing exists. And she's like, well, I Googled it basically, and it does. And like <laughs> the, the the stage guy is like, yeah, I don't know that curve. And she's like, well, I was researching 30 foot yada yas. I mean, that's pretty great. And yeah. also just imagine being the guy who didn't do the homework, who then goes to get and gets rinsed by Beyonce on camera that now lives forever. Like, R.I.P. to y'all. Like, that's, I feel bad for But y'all. honestly, an honor, you know, to be I, rinsed I, I by hope, Beyonce on camera. I would hope they view camera. it that way. I would <laughs> hope they view it that way. But it's like, it's embarrassing for you and your families, respectfully. <laughs> <laughs> just letting you know. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit structurally about the film because we're yeah. talking about these behind the scenes vignettes and they basically, there's set list, vignette, set list, behind the uh, scenes, set list, behind the scenes. Yes. And it's cutting in and out yes. of various lengths. Sometimes mm-hmm. you get a long run of songs, sometimes you get a shorter run yeah, of songs. Yeah, I would songs. say like the front part of the film is more vignettes uh, bal- and the balance on the back end is, is fewer vignettes. The one that really worked for me is the very first one, which is about the scale of the tour and about the people it takes to put it on. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, was instantly you get a counterpoint to what Era's tour film was doing. Era's tour film is all in the show. Mm-hmm. It wants you to feel like you are at the concert. You're seeing super. You're getting a lot of super close-ups of Taylor, a lot of wide of the the football stadiums mm-hmm. that she's playing in, but you never see any seams it's all music it's Mm -hmm. all show it's all song no voiceover no nothing whereas this i feel like doesn't want you to be in one moment it wants you to be in every moment Mm -hmm. and the other way you see that along with the you know 160 uh trucks that it takes to move the beyonce tour around Mm -hmm. the country and then eventually around the world um but you also see it in the outfit changes uh because she wore multiple costumes for the same performance and often in an the song that you're hearing, you're seeing her wearing all the different fits mm-hmm. that she wore for that song throughout the tour. Right. So to they me, film, it was like a longitudinal entire, And they filmed the entire tour, it seems, whereas the Taylor show is they filmed those set of Los Angeles shows. Yes. So it's interesting to me that while the Taylor 
tour is the one that is supposed to be ranging across her whole catalog, but the movie is focused in one moment, and mm. the Renaissance film is supposed to be focused on this one album, and mm. you barely get any other songs, mm-hmm. uh, and yet it's it's like a longitudinal study of the tour, you know. So those those I thought those were interesting choices from it, each of them. It's also a longitudinal study of like Beyonce as businesswoman in addition to Beyonce as artist. I mean, one of my main takeaways from the non-musical portions of this film, it reminded me a lot of, forgive me, I don't listen to podcasts, but like what I imagine, podcasts about like the founding of like a tech startup, where it's just like, this was hard, we struggled with this, this was a setback. Like these kinds of like the making of a business that's what those things are intended to tell you. And again, that's a part of why it was so striking to, to watch Truth or Dare after this, because you sort of forget that people sometimes just let cameras roll. I mean, obviously, like, we have people with their cameras rolling constantly on our phones. So it's not that it's impossible, but a star of this magnitude. Uh, we've been trained. We've been trained to, to welcome the breadcrumbs. Although we, she's filming everything all the time, which we know about Beyonce from but, past journalism Mm -hmm. about her is that she has this incredible archive sure she's constantly being trailed but that's why they're they're able to select the little moments that they want to tell the story they're going to tell because they have everything it's not like they just happen to get a couple things it's like she's filming at all times but you're seeing 0.001 percent of everything that's shot of beyonce behind the scenes given that i felt particularly I would say pleased to see some of the conversation around Blue Ivy being talked about in the film because it's maybe one of the only moments where you sense, and again, these are um, organized contrivances of vulnerability, right? But um, where you sense a kind of anxiety, self-doubt in Beyonce of, am I handling this correctly? Do you like, want to talk about what it is? Sure. So, so one Ivy. of the full behind-the-scenes segments yes. is about Blue Ivy. Right. And Blue Ivy, uh, if you've been watching footage from the tour online, uh, which song is it that Blue Ivy does? My this? Power? Yes. So Blue Ivy is dancing part of the troupe. On the front line, ready for work. Her arrival onto the stage is like a big thing. She's coming Comes up, up on the, the bottom like the, Beyonce does. Right. So it's like a whole set piece. Um, Beyonce originally says she has to do it. I felt some anxiety about that. I know what it's like to have worked so hard. I worked incredibly hard when I was that age. It was like kind of thankless and grueling and probably a lot, of, probably unpleasant in a lot of ways. And even though she actually separately, the thing uh, that she talks about later in the film about the growl in her voice, how that kind of originates with a overzealous music producer pushing her when she was 12 or 13 years old. A vocal injury. Yeah, but she learned to take advantage of it and and access it when she needs it later on in life. Um, But wanting to protect, I mean, here's the thing, one generation struggles in hopes that the next generation might not. Now, the nature of struggle for the child of, one of the most famous pop stars on the planet and one of the most famous rappers on the planet is obviously different. But Beyonce saying, I don't know how much of this to expose her to, and almost, I don't know how much of this to hand to her. Well, this is this this part of it was kind of funny to me. On one hand, she's like, I didn't want to just hand her a sold out stadium performance, like her first. Got to earn it. You got to put Mercury Lounge. Yeah, first. like you got to play some small show. You got to play some talent shows before you get seventy k, <laughs> mm-hmm. like cheering your name. But then she like yada yadas the whole consideration of letting her do it, and then she's like, and then I just let her do it. One time. Right. And then the one time didn't go so well. She got made fun of on the internet. So I let her do it again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And so like the Nepo baby part, like she's trying to sort of like explain away. She's not beating those allegations. Yeah, I'm saying she's not beating the Nepo baby allegations because she's basically like, she asked me, I said no. And then I just said yes. (laughs) Like, And we don't get to hear any of the like, how did you arrive at the place where you thought, okay, actually it's fine for her to have never performed before at 11 years old and automatically get to be the centerpiece of a a sold-out stadium But do you think that the moment where the first show happens, there's this negative feedback on the internet, and then that makes Blue work harder 
or like that is was that, the lesson, right? But that, I'm saying is that as close to a struggle narrative that might be available in this situation? It is. It is funny to imagine that it's like the only way you can get your preteen to work hard <laughs> at that age to em- potentially embarrass them in front of 70,000 people. And also offer them the opportunity to dance in front of 70,000 people. You yeah, know, it's I, like... I don't know. I, like, I don't, I've never danced in front of like 70,000 people. Like, for instance, people. like, I don't know, like the Obamas, you know, they interned. Uh, they, they got good internships in film and television or whatever. Do you think that the Obama internships, do you think that they did real intern work? Look, I'm sure they were I, treated better than many interns, but like... They still had to, their title was intern, not like star of the My Power Dance number, you know? I'm not saying it's wrong. Like, you're Beyonce. You can give your daughter whatever you want. Absolutely. But to then try to convince us that, in fact, it was a lesson about working hard and uh, is I'm like. Not, I'm more open to that. I think it is a lesson on some level because I think if you grow up around that, you might find it normal. You might find that it's given or hand. You might believe that it's handed out. Like, I don't know how hard my parents worked. Certainly when I was like 10 or 12, I don't think I was fully aware of how hard my parents worked. And that level of labor, I'm sure, you know, like the scenes. And again, like effective, smart of like after the show, Blue Ivy like sleeping on the side and Beyonce like typing on her lap. First of all, Beyonce, do you want to come creative direct podcast in like your free hours? Because <laughs> you really be putting in late hours and early hours. I will say the whole Blue Ivy section was worth it because it's really the main Jay-Z moment in the whole film. So good. He's barely in it, but he he does this thing where he ta- where he's telling Blue Ivy how excited Beyonce was to watch her dance. Doing and he's the like, faces. He's doing the faces, imitating her, and he says she was at the end of her smile. Yeah. And I was just like, like goosebumps. You also, know? Jay-Z, incredible hats in this movie. You like those hats? I do. I really think, um, you know, Jay took a while to, like, arrive at, like, true adult style. And, like, (laughs) these hats, this is, like, this is great. Uh, Absolutely. These should be in the Brooklyn Library exhibit. Yeah. He is. He's full dad mode uh, in this film and and barely present, which I thought was was. I mean, obviously a choice. But, like, yes. yes. I mean, you mostly see him uh, as a fan. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, if you think of the Jay-Z in this film, and then you think of the implied Jay-Z of the Lemonade era, yeah. we've get, everybody's come a long way. Right, which she alludes to quite a few times. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> see you, bro. <laughs> see you. Um, so I had written down a couple of things. Literally, a thing I typed in, the, in my phone while we were watching them was, how did you let Beyonce down today? Uh, there's a lot of that. And I will say... Even though the non-musical parts in moments feel kind of like, here's how I triumphed in business. Obviously, the subtext of that is, here are all the people who tried to prevent me from triumphing in business. And she says that. She's like, I have to break people down as a black woman. Yes. People talk to me crazy, and they think I'm talking to them crazy when, in fact, I'm just getting stuff done. Right. And she's like, I just have to wear them down until they're like, all right, we'll figure it out. And so the fact that there is this parallel narrative of how all these people essentially working for Beyonce, like in her employ, but working against her. Right. That tension is interesting, especially when you take on the scale of a tour. I watched the Beyonce screen being assembled and I'm like, the sphere, sphere, the sphere, they just, that's it. Detonate the sphere. It doesn't, doesn't need to exist. Or just give Beyonce the sphere. Yeah, literally that's your new house. Yes. (laughs) You live here now, Uh, Beyonce. Um, Fish, come on. Give it to Beyonce. What are we doing? (laughs) So I was happy to see a tremendous amount of focus on the the behind-the-scenes things. There are moments where I know I'm supposed to be watching Beyonce perform or watching the dancers perform, but really what's capturing your attention are the crew members moving Mm -hmm. things around. Um, And she said as well that she wanted to – she underscored and wanted to highlight them. She put them in reflective outfits so that people would see them rather than the all-black outfits that often keep them invisible. Yeah, I mean she was making sure that labor was on your mind as you were entering the Renaissance. Yeah. Uh, Which, like, I thought it was cool. I I, Like, I enjoyed it. But then again, like you're saying, like – 
I prefer the stuff where it's like, well, she still knows better. Like, did you know Beyonce was a lighting savant? Incredible. <laughs> like, she's just like, I lear- I've i learned so much about lighting that like, I, n- I know what the lights should look like mm-hmm. and I'm constantly adjusting them even th- as the tour goes on. Right, that the last show is different from the first show. But she's probably like, in ways that nobody can notice except for her. Right, and also she talks a lot, of, a lot about the spotlight and the absence of light. And that's something that I think probably only a super famous person would truly be preoccupied right. and wanting to find ways to both exist inside the spotlight, but also knowing perfectly well when the light should not be on. Can we talk about the music? We've talked yeah. almost exclusively mm-hmm. so far about the behind the scenes mm-hmm. stuff, which are a, a, a big part of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would still say there's more concert in this than mm-hmm. there is anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, strange choice to start this show with the ballads. And, and if you read the reviews or the reports of opening night and the first few shows, I think everybody who wrote about the show or who had filed some kind of report was like, huh, first 30 minutes, first 40 minutes, pretty much all slow stuff. That wasn't how this film was. They condensed that. Interesting, but- though, that you still like you start with two ballads in this film. Mm-hmm. In, in the show itself, it was more like five or even six. And a, a piece of news in this film is that Beyonce had a knee injury, which some almost- people knew. There was okay. some. There was like a. There was an errant tweet about it from the Dubai performance. Uh, from a, a journalist saying like Beyonce is healing from an injury, and then that tweet was then deleted. Oh, I don't remember. And that. then when the tour opened in Europe, it was very clear, I think, to most people that she was dancing not as much as she usually yes. does, and was quite uh, and quite obviously stationary. Part, I would assume part of the reason the show started the way it started. Yes, and I think but that they actually show in the film yes, her knee being they drained. Should, yes, the, they they admit yeah. to the yes. fact that she had been recovering from a surgery. I think her dancing got stronger as the tour went on, from the way that people describe it but i think that she also she set that she controlled that narrative in the film as well where she was very much like this show is about my voice i can move less than Mm -hmm. i used to i'm you know i'm in my 40s now it's amazing that i'm still here i'm still doing this and there are many times throughout the show music is a young person someone said that (laughs) someone said that yeah you want to use beyonce as an exception like Fine, like I'm, I'll 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 take that one. I uh, literally this <laughs> the entire rest of this episode is going to be rinsing you about what you said last week. Okay, but go on. Um, but yeah, she was she was very much underlining the fact that like this show and this movie, therefore, is about the strength of my voice. Yeah. Which truly, like, she does. She like basically winks. Like, are you ready for me to do the run in Drunken Love mm-hmm. when she mimics the sample? Uh, near the end and it's just like okay like the house is the house is rubble now neither you nor I saw the renaissance tour live yes life just, happens like yes, just, like like Beyonce says we are humans like she is we are not robots I do want to say like to people I feel like on the discord that's or the what Facebook I'm group this comes up there's like some conspiracy like why didn't we see the I mean at life, least for there's me, a lot of life, life happens happening. and also just for the record I was at Beyonce Coachella which I feel like I should have opened this entire segment with right Bar not like I, there's no concert experience of any performer maybe ever. But in terms of like depth of quality performance, depth of ideology, uh, consistent shock, like innovation, like minute fifty is different than minute thirty. Um, uh, the the disconnect almost between like something that good happening at such a banal thing as Coachella, like. It's the last time I've been to Coachella. I you'll never go. Why would I, mean, I go back? Yeah, no. I mean, I I've said this in other contexts before, but it it bears repeating. I only went that year to review Beyonce. She hadn't done a live show really of any kind for two or three years, maybe prior to that. And we had sort of stopped covering festivals like institutionally because there's every festival review is the same. Some famous people played, some less famous people played, some things were good, some things were bad. Um but this seemed like worth worth covering. Uh, when I got back to my hotel, when first I mean, getting back to my hotel at like two in the morning, like through the mud, terrible experience. But when I got back to my hotel room, I like looked at my phone for my notes, and like I had as many notes as I did from the movie last night, which is to say like twenty lines, because I was so gobsmacked, and I. I Coachella is a terrible place to see a show, particularly down in the front, which is like press slash VIP slash whatever. 
it's people wanting to be seen, it's people like filming themselves. It's it's a bad environment. Even now, I struggle to find words. I'm it, I'm blown away that I was able to file any copy that night. Yeah. It was that overwhelming. No performer is that smart, that historically minded, that fundamentally creative, that punchy, like, and almost like that indignation of like, oh, y'all didn't let me do this for years. I'm gonna come do it better than anybody ever has done previously and anybody ever could fathom a way to do it subsequently. And then just, and then that's it. And explode the whole thing. Anyway. So you're saying Renaissance Tour had a lot to live up to. I'm saying, I'm just saying like the person who did that, it's not that you can't repeat that, but the specific cultural and historical moment, that's hard to repeat. Well, here's my take, which is that the best Beyonce concert film, unfortunately, is not Renaissance, and it is not even Homecoming. It is the bootleg of rip of the Coachella live stream sure. just straight up. Right, like, not the edited version. Without an edited version. Yeah, the Homecoming mm-hmm. is the mm-hmm. one where yeah, it yeah. has the behind-the-scenes stuff, it has the mm-hmm. poetry on top, mm-hmm. you know, it has Beyonce narration. Mm-hmm. To me, it's just the show front to back. Mm-hmm. Like, I've watched it half a dozen times yeah. all the way through. Mm-hmm. Like, it is the live performance of my lifetime. Yeah. And I agree. Look, Renaissance, she's doing something very specific. And she's explaining over and over again in this movie. She doesn't mention Coachella, uh, Beachella, as mm-hmm. as it's known. Yeah. Um, but she's sort of saying, like, this is different. This is much more narrow than that. This is a specific culture, a specific album. It's about... Right, paying it, homage, right. It's about release. It's about paying homage to this queer dance music that her that her Uncle Johnny mm-hmm. showed her. All of that. Like, I know this is not my favorite mode of Beyonce. Like, this this culture, this, you know, uh, the, the Vogue culture, the ballroom culture mm-hmm. that she's paying tribute to, you know, I, I like Paris is Burning mm-hmm. as much as the next straight white man. Like, you know, like prob- probably more, probably maybe more. more. Maybe Let's more. be honest, probably yeah, more. Probably more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is not like, this is not my favorite Beyonce album. And uh, it is so concentrated mm-hmm. on that, that like I found myself responding most to the moments that are the most like Coachella. So, for instance, when she does Church Girl into Get Me Bodied, Mm -hmm. you know, like this. The other thing is like Coachella is all montage. It's all um, Mm -hmm. it's like a DJ set. Basically, it's threading together. It's it's threading together Mm -hmm. black music Mm -hmm. through the marching band tradition. It's a history lesson. Um, And this is, you know, there's a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Like you get the toxic strings in there at one point, Britney Spears, you know, you get like a couple, uh, little Uzi Vert, just want to rock. Yeah. Yeah. Like a mention of a song here and there, Mm -hmm. but like, she's not really, she's not really threading music together in the way that she has for like a decade prior to Mm -hmm. this. But when she would do that, like, like the church girl, Mm -hmm. get me bodied moment. Like that's where I was like, okay. And church girl is also like, it's the most old Beyonce song on Renaissance, Mm -hmm. you know? And like, like, that's just where my heart is. Like, I just prefer that. Like, there's another moment, and I turn to you. You get Break My Soul, the Queen's remix mm-hmm. that she does, right, where she brings in Vogue. a little bit of Vogue at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the next song you hear is Formation. And, like, to me, the divide there is just, like, like... You formation to you. Is, yeah, yeah, I'm just, like, mm-hmm. like Break My Soul, like, that's a good that's a good beat like mm-hmm. it's fine but like that's not a that's not a classic Beyonce song to me mm-hmm. and then she goes into formation and I'm like oh like right now I'm here mm-hmm. so the fact that and and it's funny because I felt this way in eras too where it's like the the album at the center of this thing I don't believe is either of their best work no so I found myself responding more to when they went to the old stuff no and it's interesting we talked about this a little bit yesterday because of what you just said that this specific album is not the best work, I think, of either of these artists, but the aggregate fame, celebrity power... The moment. Is, is in fact, their peak moment, I think. You don't think Coachella is Beyonce's peak moment? I think she's still growing. I think Coachella is a moment, but I think there's I, something about the power, because broadly speaking, I agree with you about Renaissance, but the fact that Renaissance had the impact that it did fostered the discourse that it did and built this tour or set the table for this tour. I don't know if this tour happens 
at this level five years ago or eight years ago. I'm just not sure. I think like the Beyonce narrative and Beyonce's overall culture of power continues to grow. Like to me, the creative and cultural high point is Coachella, but I don't think that that's necessarily true for everybody. That's still an isolated thing that if you were there that night or the two nights, and if you saw it on film, that's one thing, but there's something bigger and more global about this. And I think part of it is post pandemic, you know, like having a sense of release. There's also a lot of talk in this film, you know, right at the beginning, Beyonce's talking about safe space and community. And I think that people have arrived at a moment wanting that and Beyonce very proactively saying that is what I'm here to provide. That to me maybe wouldn't have happened quite as much five to 10 years ago. Um, so I think, no, to me, this does feel like peak power. Um, and, and the other thing, just to touch on the, on the uh, voguing and the dancing, it's really, really great to see voguing on a stage this big, to see Kevin Jay-Z prodigy, um, Kevin Aviance uh, is in there for a sec. Uh, the Honey Balenciaga interview is like really, really good. That that That's interstitial, great. that behind the, so the, the behind the scenes part that focused on the Vogers mm -hmm. and the ballroom stuff specifically, mm -hmm. I thought again uh, was up there with the uh, the the behind the scenes tour building mm -hmm. of the set stuff as the best of those. Um, and specifically <laughs> the Honey Balenciaga story. The Renaissance is like a nice tribute to that stuff, but like that stuff is that is like, yes, you know, like yes. when you see it pure. Well, and this is why it's interesting to watch this film also side by side with Truth or Dare, because there's a tremendous amount of this in Truth or Dare. And the one thing that I was struck by in revisiting that film, Everybody in Renaissance is extremely reverent of Beyonce. Yes. There is no one, I don't mean like talking back like in a petulant way, but no one's kind of poking or playing. There's not a sense of uh, playfulness between Beyonce and the people who are working for Beyonce, who are doing the labor of creating this show. And the one thing that I was struck by in Truth or Dare, and again, it says 30 years ago, the back and forth playfulness, Madonna and the dancers. Now, obviously there's some language stuff that's not great. Like, you know, in, in the rear view, some of it doesn't feel good. It's not, it's not, it, it wouldn't pass, uh, it wouldn't pass muster some of it in 2023. But that kind of a uh, destabilized power balance, uh, I was very struck by to see that on film. In the Renaissance film, there is no destabilized power balance. It is extremely clear at all moments who is in charge. Yeah, I mean, because Beyonce. Blue Ivy. <laughs> yeah, the, I, yeah, there is the Blue Ivy moment yeah. that I loved. One of the quicker behind the scenes flashes mm -hmm. is like used to comedic effect where yeah. you hear a little bit of the next song and they cut to Blue Ivy yeah. and Beyonce is like, well, the, someone's like, what if we just don't do Diva? Right. We'll cut Diva. And Blue Ivy is like, you can't cut Diva. How, did you, How did you cut Diva? And, and she's like, I'm going to need you to calm down yeah. and not interrupt yeah. people. <laughs> it's like, I appreciate that you have an opinion, but like we're having a real conversation here. And she then, was right though. <laughs> right. And then they go right into Diva. Can we take it up? No, please, please. Diva? Her formation run the world. No. My power, Black Parade. I wonder the degree to which Beyonce watched the Madonna film to set, to set, to figure out what the right boundaries or balance in this film was. I, I wonder, because there is a fair amount of consonance. There's fair, there's consonance in the subject matter. There's consonance in the balance between performance behind the scenes. Um, but Truth or Dare is like forever on the on the precipice of like unspooling. Like Madonna's about to get arrested. She something terrible happens to something on her, someone on her entourage. There's dancers having problems with their families. Yeah. I'd be curious to know uh, how much, especially given you know with the Queen's remix of Break. It's like people. The references are there. Yeah, they're on like the surface. Yes, yes, and she has drawn attention to them. It's not that they're not being hidden at all. Yes. What did you make of the choice? Because again, I think like you're saying that the renaissance-ness of it worked for you, but you're not really talking about the specific song. Like, were there performances of songs that you thought really made it? Like, really, or like put the music in new context for you or made it work more than the album itself? So something we haven't said is, is that the album is played in order. There are other things. It, it's not exclusively. It's not only the album, but the album is played in order. Um, I pulled up the list. Um, I remember 
I remember thinking the answer is maybe no. Nothing reframed what I thought about the album itself. Unlike the Coachella performance, which you really you're unspooling songs to DNA level and then recontextualizing. That's not um, cozy mm -hmm. into Alien Superstar. You like that? Yeah. Um, and I will say, I don't think I've ever seen Megan Thee Stallion happier than during this performance of Savage. Like it's it's really like this is this is Hall of Fame. This is a Hall of Fame moment for it's 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 maybe not the best Beyonce moment in the film, but to see the power of what Beyonce does to those around her, you see it a tiny bit with Diana Ross. Like you you don't, don't see it with Kendrick. I was just literally say you do not at all see it. like Kendrick. I'm not even Kendrick. Like, was what, like, he was like, like I'm in I'm, and I'm, I'm out. out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, was like, he was back home by nine fifteen. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, but Megan, like that's like when you have been chosen, the light has shined upon you. I thought that was like the one unscripted, the one truly unscripted moment is the fact that Megan is not even as good on a mic in a stadium as everybody mm -hmm. else on stage because she just hasn't done it. Yeah. So like when she's leaving, she's sort of like squealing. She's like so excited. She's like so vibrating. Yeah. And that, again, put into contrast to me, like even when we're seeing imperfect quote unquote you know off script Beyonce like she's still Beyonce but like mm -hmm. Megan was truly off script mm -hmm. and like you could feel the dissonance in that part uh with like with all these cameras all these lights on her mm -hmm. and yeah it felt it felt very real very real last thing I'll say about the Renaissance film especially vis-a-vis -vis the Eras tour film is the Beyonce version is one minute shorter we're talking two hours and 48 minutes okay. for Renaissance versus two hours and 49 minutes for Eras Tour. Pointed. They both went to each other's premieres. I was just going to say, like, this is, yes, Taylor went to the Beyonce premiere. Yes. Well, the footage we actually need is, like, what was the summit, the accord reached? What were the negotiations like yeah. where they were talking about how long are these movies going to be yeah. <laughs> and how long are these movies going to be? Versus each other. Like, why not just make them both the exactly same? Exactly Like, because you saw the Blake Lively Instagram post that was like... Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> where she was like, women don't have to compete. Yes. Uh, like, Taylor and Beyonce mm -hmm. have told me that because they went to each other's premieres. You know, Blake Lively went with Taylor, mm -hmm. etc. And I'm like, okay, but then why is Taylor's movie one minute longer? <laughs> or why is Beyonce's one minute shorter? Yeah. <laughs> That's, someone that someone feels, needs to get to the bottom of this. That feels like the choice. Okay, someone get to the bottom of this. Speaking of musicians in a <laughs> mid to later part of their career. Um, still innovating. St sort of. In business. In business, yes. Uh, Garth Brooks. Okay, so Garth Brooks. It's a country singer. Def uh, do, you not, do you guys know who Garth Brooks is? I mean, do we have to do like a Garth, Garth Brooks, Brooks retired in 2001. <laughs> no, he, oh, he certainly didn't. Uh, <laughs> do we need a pricey on Garth Brooks? One of the best selling artists of all time. Garth Brooks is a country singer. Uh, really, the sort of um, dominant figure in what I like to term the power country of the 90s and the late 80s and the 90s. Um, Garth Brooks, at his, in his time, was perceived as somewhat heretical for bringing arena ambitions to country. Now, of course, that's hilarious when you think of what's happened in country in the last two to three decades, but there was a point where people were like, Garth Brooks isn't taking it seriously enough. And I would actually say, Garth Brooks isn't taking it seriously enough, but in a totally different way. Uh, so Garth Brooks is uh, a little bit hammy. Yep. Garth Brooks is, uh, dare I say, like, a. Uh, a, a singer who's as influenced by country and rock and like low key, the, the inflections and phrasings of musical theater, um, the way that he delivers a lyric. Um, but Garth Brooks also knows his lane, understands it intuitively. So there is this new album. It is called Time Traveler. How can you ident how can you find Time Traveler? There's a couple ways. <laughs> One, you can imagine that this album exists only in 1994, which sort of low-key does, sonically. All right, let's play. First of all, let's play a song, which I'm sure you haven't heard. Uh, Nobody has heard these songs. No. 
I'm the only person in America, and I didn't even bring it. I'm sorry. Um, which song do you want to hear? I want to hear only country music, because this is where he's referencing Friends in Low Places and various other country albums. A great country music conceit. Yes. Country songs referring to other country songs. All right. Other co- only country music. Garth Brooks. traveler can't travel through time because it is trapped on a compact disc in the 1990s it's trapped on a compact disc in a box with other compact discs sealed available only at bass pro shops or on bass pro shops website now when we talked about this a couple weeks ago like obviously we were like we're going on a field trip yeah like for the bit we'll go we didn't pull that off, but fortunately, Bass Pro Shop's website eventually did start shipping them. And pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. I got mine in a couple days. Uh, and then I took, ripped the box. Like, it was like these, uh, those people who, like, buy card boxes. You know, like, sport card boxes. Like, yeah. you know, get the blade out and cut yeah. it up. Cut it up. You watch a lot of um, baseball card unboxing yeah, videos? Yeah, breaking. I think yeah. they're called breaking. <laughs> If anybody wants to buy my childhood baseball card collection, by the way, like send me a note. I'll throw mine in too. Yeah, yeah, great. Like I'd love to. That's that'd be a great uh, segment on a future episode of the show. Um, so I broke the box, took the CD, I dusted off my CD drive USB plug CD drive to rip to rip a CD. I'm not ripped like a, a true CD. pirate. Yeah, I mean I haven't ripped a CD and. Six years, eight years. And even then, you were one of the last people doing it. Definitely. Um, so here's the footage of the CD popping out of the USB drive. First of all, everybody should have one of these. Yeah. I everybody did, cares about music. Yeah, I did have to find the USB to lightning uh, dongle because it's it's my new machine doesn't have pure USB. So anyway, we ripped it uh, and listened to this album, which... It's fine. It sounds exactly like every other growth book. And again, the fact that we are in the year 2023 and Garth Brooks has nary a concession to the current moment. Actually, let's listen to uh, Neon Neighborhood because this is as close as we get to Garth Brooks acknowledging that like Nashville's changed a little bit. I think we need to underline this point. We haven't said this. Garth Brooks music is not available on Spotify. Oh, yes. It is all. not Sorry. available yes. on Apple Music. You can only stream Garth Brooks through Amazon. Amazon has a streaming service. Apparently, it's quite good. I, yeah, sure. Uh, I think he, he, likes the, he likes the payout there. They, sure. they pay a higher rate. Uh, he is the last and most popular, Hold meaningful out. holdout against streaming Mm -hmm. and when he tells the story when he tells the story of how this album in this box set ended up a bass pro shop exclusive and also we say one of a series of box sets yes he's a box set guy yeah so since his retirement there's new music always hidden in box sets yeah and since his retirement in 2001 (laughs) his retirement he retired Sure. When he came he's back. put out like nine albums. Yeah, yeah. And retired. since like, he's too, come back. He's like too short. Yes. <laughs> he's he's too short of country music. Since he's come back, he <laughs> only releases music in limited ways, especially. he start, You know, he started an iTunes uh, competitor called Ghost Tunes no, back in the day. I did not know Yeah, that. yeah. He's, he's, he is, is that number, still extant? No. Ghost Tunes didn't make it, believe it or not. Are you but sure? then again, neither did iTunes. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the real loser? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Garth Brooks well, tells like, this. 
him and Neil Young working together. Yeah, like, right. okay. Yeah, on Ponyo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, only, no. it only gets played on the, um, what was the, uh, the amp, like the. Uh, yeah, the other stream area. The, the, other thing. the thing we can't even remember ah, the name of. Ah. <laughs> the Zune. Zune. The Zune. <laughs> the Zune Ghost Tunes Ponyo. Yo, real alternative culture there. Yes. Y'all, so, you weren't there. Garth Brooks tells a story about how he played the 50th anniversary party for Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> Which, like, who of course, us? Yeah, he like, was like, us? this is in a billboard interview. He's like, I got to chatting with the CEO, and the CEO said he was a big water conservation guy. And Garth Brooks is like, yeah, this is just like how songwriters don't get paid off streaming. <laughs> and the guy was like, way to, way to stretch a metaphor. Bro. Yeah. And the guy was like, how can we fix that? And Garth Brooks was like, well, I have been looking for a partner for my next box set. <laughs> Yo, but. Truthfully, how does that fix the songwriters getting paid for streaming <laughs> problem? Like, if also if your songs are not available on streaming services, not yep. to be confused with streams of water, right? It's a metaphor. Is it? <laughs> how does the how do these songs being sold at Bass Pro Shops? How many, we'll never. Uh, to your point, we'll never know how many copies of this right. were sold. Right. I would venture to say not many copies of this are sold. How does that help songwriters? I Genuinely, think by that proving that there is a, an income stream, a better income stream possible. Like, imagine if, if you were imagine a songwriter if, on this album, I encourage you to figure out how much money you made off of the Bass Pro Shops exclusive and see if it's better than the admitted fractions of pennies that you made on a streaming service. But he's saying it's possible. Imagine if the next Travis Scott album could only be purchased at Kith locations around or the country. Or Audemars Piguet. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are paying attention, <laughs> yo, you have to go to the AP store to get like Utopia Volume Two. Yes, I mean, look, he's he's just presenting an alternative business model. What Drake does with it is up to him. I don't like it. I don't like it. I also think, like, on a fundamental level, if you're Garth Brooks and your audience is so vast and also so digitally unsavvy. You can keep the thing that I actually find maybe the most reprehensible about these box sets. It's it's consistent. You find these reprehensible? Yeah, it's consistent repackaging of music that the consumer already has, but hiding a new album in there yeah, to buy. It. But like, that's why we got that new Beatles song too. Also reprehensible. <laughs> Literally, I had to I had to do that bit at a party this weekend. Someone was like, "What do you think of the Beatles song?" And I was like, "Oh, you don't want to ask me that question. Like, I already have a I have like a worked out a worked out <laughs> yeah, like, answer for that." Yeah. Um, no, to me, it's reprehensible because, look, I think the box set cost maybe like the MSRP was like 40 bucks, but maybe it was $30 on the website, whatever. You're making someone pay $30 largely for music that they already have. This has happened multiple times with Garth Brooks. There are these multiple multi-album box sets. This box set gathers, as you pointed out earlier, um, the last five post-retirement Garth Brooks albums. If you are a dedicated Garth Brooks fan, you already have those. You have these albums. Why are you forcing your most dedicated fans to double pay? This is like literally yeah, at the yeah, invention. Yeah, no pop stars of, do that now. <laughs> no, but this is literally like at the invention of compact disc moment when people are like, I guess you're going to replace all the music you've paid for on vinyl or cassette. You're going to pay for it again. Garth Brooks is still living in like the 1993 mentality. Taylor Swift says, welcome to 2023, baby. Speaking of older artists working with uh, outmoded business models and outmoded creative models. Um, the transitions, the transition game is um, we're okay. sh shaky, but, but... But we're trying. We're trying. We're trying. Yeah. Um, Gary. The Golden Bachelor. Asterisk. Gary, <laughs> the Golden Bachelor. Uh, so that's over now, sort of. So Gary, pick Teresa. I, I know you didn't watch the entire thing. I tried to catch up after mm -hmm. Renaissance, uh, but I was so exhausted from dancing in the aisles that I fell asleep. That, that is true. During the Golden Bachelor. You hit the, the Twizzler nibs and you hit the popcorn and you were off to the They races. were Skittles gummies. Is that what they were? Yeah. Oh, they smelled like nibs. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So picked Teresa, left Leslie essentially by the side of the road. A couple things. One, kudos to Leslie who basically was like, uh, and you can bleep this. You don't tell me how to feel. Uh, 
the other thing, and this came up before I had watched the show, you said, oh, there's this Hollywood reporter thing. And as he told Entertainment Tonight, I mean, I haven't dated in 45 years. However, the Hollywood reporter has come to learn of inconsistencies with this narrative after speaking with one woman who preferred to have her identity protected and who claimed to have recently dated our Golden Bachelor. The woman would go on to have a nearly three-year relationship with Turner beginning a month after his wife's death. And they got they, Gary. They well, got you him. Basically, said <laughs> they didn't lay a hand on him. They tried to get him. There was an expose. I read it. There was an expose. Yes, and about I, the nicest man on earth. And I literally, re- I waited until after watching the episode. Uh, I watched the finale, and you see the conclusion. Like, here's a guy, Gary, sainted, sainted, sainted. by ABC. Yes, but as I said the last time we talked about the Golden Badger, what's the one thing I said that was like rubbing me wrong? Is you were like, we're getting played. No, well, I was like, my guy is out here just being like, I love you to everybody. Oh, you thought he's he like, was reckless I thought he was Lothario. Being reckless. He was just yeah. like, yo, Jesse, I love you. Like, he was just like, camera <laughs> people, I love you. He was just like, I can't believe how much love I had He had me. too much love to give. And, he, and actually, that appears to be the truth, because the one thing that Leslie says in the finale is like, I will never say what you said to me in the fantasy suite. But I was 100% certain you were going to choose me. And I wrote vows and I picked a $60,000 wedding dress. Shouts to you. Uh, and Gar- and essentially being like, you literally, your mouth wrote a check that your entire personality couldn't cash. Are you saying that Gary's a love bomber? Yes. <laughs> Here's the thing. So what did we learn? You said, I can't believe you prefaced the Hollywood Reporter thing by being like they didn't lay a hand on him. And everything in the Hollywood Reporter thing is basically like, here is a guy who is crazy reckless. He's texting someone in the immediate. Look, I have never lost a spouse. Come on. But in the immediate aftermath. And then. Uh, he had he a girlfriend. Says, Gary's crime was he had a girlfriend. Shoot. After his wife died. No, that's not the crime. They're saying that they're he's saying lying. He's quick. They're saying that he's lying on the show, which I think he because is. Because he's like, I haven't had love since my wife passed. And I don't know if he loved. And also, like, his after the fact explanation is like, it depends how you define a relationship. Extremely Clintonian, like, real Clintonian Come on. energy. Come on. Seriously Clintonian energy. So Gary's a grown up F boy. <laughs> So maybe they should send him to uh, Bachelor Paradise. <laughs> you would fit right in. Yes. You um, would get busy in Paradise. The thing that I said on the last time we talked about it is like there are things that Gary does that when if everybody was 27, we'd be like, that's tacky, but it's all right. But the stakes are so much higher in this context. And so there were moments in like the first few episodes, I was like a little bit like, Damn, you really You're not going to come to me on the set of Popcast Deluxe and be like, I knew from the jump that Gary I was a dirty you, dog. I said to you the <laughs> last time we talked about it that he is confessing intense affections for too many people and referencing the memory of, of his, his dead wife. wife. If there's anything that he's doing that I feel a little itchy about, it's telling multiple people that they remind him of his late wife or the the nature of their conversations like that's the only moment it's where this I'm guy's like, only frame of reference no i know like yeah. that's that was uncomfortable that was the only thing that was uncomfortable to me and then what you see in this hollywood reporter story is that that's something he's been doing and for him to be like it depends what a relationship is and they literally did like a public record search and were like sir this woman was receiving mail at your home like that was the address that she had listed as her address there was just something like look i blame the reality tv infrastructure they needed gary to be to be virginal, the perfect man fresh out of the mm-hmm. heartbreak of death And they needed him to revitalize the Bachelor franchise with how perfect he was. I agree. He did that. So they did that. And they gloss over. And they gloss over stuff. And I think he's so eager to please that they were like, Gary, we need you to say you haven't gotten laid in a really long time. And he's like, all right. Because you saw it before the fantasy suites when Leslie asked him, when was the last time you had sex? And he brushes it off and he's like, with myself or with another person? And then she's like, you know, she's like, you know what I mean. And he's like, uh, uh, been a while, you know? And look, I think he just wanted to do right by the production. And look, the takeaway Who amongst us doesn't want to do right by, by the production. production. But the takeaway for <laughs> what me, what lies have you told on podcast <laughs> deluxe to do right by production? Tell they me. were like, they were like, Gary, 
He said he's a small business owner. He sold his business a long time 80s. ago. And then they're like, he's a maintenance worker. And his coworkers love, love him. It. <laughs> I'm like, this guy. No, well, come on. And also, like, we give him a break. And his comeback to that was like, yeah, like, I did it for fun. Which, like, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, like, I also <laughs> just like that. Like, yeah, I installed hot tubs for fun. <laughs> so he could meet women. <laughs> Look. This was this was Prayers this up. was a monumental reality television production. Faith or Leslie for Golden Bachelorette? Both. Wow. <laughs> sicko mode. <laughs> Truly sicko mode. I wish Gary and Teresa all the best. I absolutely do as well. Um Songs of the Week. You got a song of the week? I do, actually. It's a uh, double XL. Uh, known for their freshman series and the fresh the ciphers that go with freshman series, which have been some are incredible, some are less incredible. Uh, it can be a bit of a mixed bag. But this past week, kind of not connected to any of their prior series, there's an all-female rapper cypher. Uh, so Lotto, it's curated by Lotto, sure. Uh, Flo Millie, uh, Maya the Don, Mellow Bucks, Monoleo. This is, like, very good. All of it's very good. Everyone's like really, really good. Uh, I think we should listen to look. The Lotto verse is great. I just want to say really that a good I'm, rapper, really good rapper, and and especially in a way that I think you don't always catch from the singles, but like really, really good rapper. But I think we should listen to the uh, Maya the Dawn verse because uh, it's it's tough. It's tough. It's like it's it has that exact right percentage of grit. Really, really good. So this is, you can find this on YouTube, uh, on the Double XL YouTube channel. Speaking of, podcast YouTube channel. Yeah, YouTube. subscribe. Com, subscribe, youtube.com slash podcast. Uh, this is on Double XL YouTube channel. Uh, so again, it's the all-female rapper cypher, Flo Millie, Lotto, Mono Leo, Maya the Don. Mellow Bucks. This is the Maya the Don verse. Please come get your man. He be all up in my DM. Bitches really grow up just to be somebody's BM. Yeah, I got a man, but I'm trying to hit the lottery. Been grinding all my life just to be a hot commodity. Okay. Big Don. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. oh, yeah. I also have some female rap. Look at that. But we invited someone else to the party. The deluxe edition of Hood Hottest Princess, the Sexy Red tape. This week in Sexy Red. This week in Sexy Red. Comes with a new track. Twizzer. <laughs> called Ghetto Princess. Yeah. Uh, produced by Mike Will. Yeah. Uh, along with Sean Ferrari. And Chief Keef has a verse on here. Chief Keef doesn't do a lot of guest verses for Not people. Yeah. Chief Keef's guest verse on the Drake album got cut short, which is a travesty. Condensed. It's condensed. Uh, but this one goes on, and he gets the f- to unfurl the full range yeah. of Chief Keefness. And his voice is just, he's just still doing new things. Speaking of Beyonce growl, like he has a real growl on this song. Uh, and the way he just modulates as it goes on and on, he just, I love, I love when Chief Keef sounds frustrated with you. Like he's just like, I can't believe these people. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's like that's my favorite. That's my favorite tone of of Chief Keef is disgust, and you get a lot of that. On like this he works verse. in an office. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like he can't believe his coworkers are the way they are. You know, uh, and I think you hear that here. Uh, Chief Keef, sexy red. Ghetto Princess. Should we eat a snack? Yes, we should. Even though I got cookies for the team. Before I'm prepared to have another snack. So we're going savory today. Yeah, that's fine. I took a recent trip to the UK. I've never been there. I heard you've been there. Uh, I've never been Is to it London a trip before. To the UK, if you live there, <laughs> do we think of it as a trip? If you lived in London, I just said you've been. Okay, I'm just simply saying like that's like a, okay. I'm just I, I want them to drink for real. I have to say the selection at Heathrow. 
of snacks was not as vast as I wanted it to be. You didn't hit up like a supermarket. You I didn't really like have time. Stop. Like I didn't UK get to. Exotic spot. I was too busy in Harrods. I didn't get a chance oh, to go to like out in <laughs> whatever oh, the CVS of, okay. of London is. Okay, big racks. Uh, is there Seven Eleven of London? Yo, you bought you bought all the black hoodies in Harrods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every last one. <laughs> um, but I grabbed two bags of crisps. Great. That's what they call chips. They do. Uh, chips are something else. That's a different thing. Um, they wouldn't travel well. Yeah, I got um, I got discos. These are these are cheese and onion. Uh, these these spoke to me as quite English. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why I got them. And then these, which I've never seen before, uh, which are I guess the Walkers equivalent of like a Frito type thing. They're called Quavers. These okay. are Walkers, which is their version of Lay's. Yes. Uh, and these are barbecue sauce flavored Quavers. Oh, yeah. Oh, ooh, barbecue-y. It smells exactly like McDonald's Okay, so like sauce. here's the thing about certain uh, chip brands, crisp brands, all the same shape. Mm-hmm. Like, not, no variation. A British crisp in general is much sturdier than an American Lay's mm-hmm. greased out crumb. There's a certain culinary misery to the United Kingdom. <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. Um, Seem troubled. It's not bad. It's just wrong. This is the thing. Their, their chips are just not our chips. It really does get styrofoamy when you're chewing it. The thickness of it really starts like a true crisp slash chip should shatter. Yeah, it should absolutely. You should bite it, and it like explodes into a million pieces. This gets like reconstituted, Become, becomes a glue. Yeah, it gets reconstituted yeah. into like like cud, like chewing cud. <laughs> oh, that's gross. That's, that's what um, this ends up as, and the flavor is like very clearly. It is powder. You know, yeah. it is a powder flavor. Yeah. Uh, the Quavers, as a Bugles man yourself, yep. I think this might speak to you, right, okay. but it's fine. To me, not enough flavor there. Uh, but again, you have a mild. Oh, that's palette. interesting that they are basically Frito shaped, but they are like Bugle texture. Yeah. Oh, wow. It really is like brown sauce from a squeeze bottle mm-hmm. at like a kebab truck, mm-hmm. at like three in the morning kind of vibe. I don't like discos. I don't like discos. Why is this chip like this? <laughs> it also kind of giving, it's giving cheese doodle. It's giving like original cheese, not Cheeto. In the sense of like, I can feel the aeration inside the solidness of this thing. This is more like a Pringle than it's like a lay. And I don't in like shape? it. In shape? No, in ta- in flavor of the chip that's interesting but a pringle at least cracks yeah it's it's like a it's like a double pringle a double thickness pringle i don't like either of these these are not good three on the quavos i apologize sancho three on the quavos um i'll go four on that because at least the flavor feels like yeah, a the, tiny oniony, bit better. the oniony the oniony onion a little bit better. is sharp yeah but like the texture itself not pleasant all right. I'm not going to be importing my chips. Yeah, I was going to say, we're not in, the import, yeah. not in the crisp import business. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you have a, a regional or, or a regional national snack that you think we should import, let us know. Email us at popcastnytimes.com. That's something we were always curious about. Every episode ever of Popcast is at nytimes.com slash popcast. Our show, Popcast Deluxe, is at youtube.com slash popcast. Like and subscribe. Uh, as I said, email us, get in the Discord or get in the Facebook group. That's tinyurl.com slash podcast discord or podcast Facebook and subscribe to podcast wherever you get your audio or audio slash visual product. Um, that could be on Spotify, Apple. Uh, hell, throw us a rating. Throw us a f- yeah, we th- could use it. Throw us a five star rating. Uh, our senior producer is Sawyer Roque. Our editor is Jamie Heffitz. Special thanks as always, Nell Galogli, Pat Gunther, Karen Gans, Pedro Rosado. Leslie Davis. We'll be back next week.